Round 19, buy, hold, sell, coming to you on the 4th of July. Fizz, mate, just moved to New York and you're getting all the highlights. Any big plans? Yeah, mate, 4th of July here, very big deal. Um, still haven't really figured out what it's about, but I will be going to a rave today. Uh, I'm not much of a raver, but, you know, I've got to take my opportunities here. Uh, what about you, Longy? Are you going to be shooting the guns around? <laughs> Look, no big 4th of July fans plans, but I've got uh, the birthday on the weekend. So, trip up the Hunter Valley. Do some wineries, play a bit of golf, hopefully watch the Eels beat the Warriors, and that's me coming for the weekend. Um, but look, let's let's jump right into fantasy here. So there's some pretty interesting guys to talk about. A bit of a lack of new content on the buys, but some very interesting ones here. Would you say it's time to <laughs> say goodbye? Uh, that's beautiful. Long, I'm gonna tear up. Can we just pause this podcast while I get some tissues? <laughs> Mate, we're a music channel now. We're a music channel. If anyone wants to sign me, I am free or cheap. We should, do a, we should do a musical <laughs> episode. <laughs> Sing the whole thing. Mate, we would lose every subscriber we have. <sighs> but let's jump into the man. So Jareem Bull is the first one. And look, we were talking about him last week as a guy where you got to keep an eye on him because the Tigers are going to fall off. It happened quicker than we expected. But we did call it very early. He's now at 577K, and people either need to keep him long term or sell him now from a financial perspective. Do you think he's a guy that you want to hold long term? Yeah, look, not really. I don't particularly want to hold him long term, but um, I don't think I have much option this week because there's not many great wing fullbacks playing this round. Um, he is capable of a big score. We've seen it before, a bunch of 60s. He's still a somewhat reasonable break even. So I think you can keep him one more week. But I'm not particularly liking this matchup against the Sharks. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking when teams get belted that badly, they usually bounce back and don't get belted that badly again. Now, I know this Tigers team has been woeful this year, but they have shown flashes. I'll be keeping Buller just because otherwise I might only have one or two wing fullbacks this week. But if you've got luxury where he's your third you might, you might want to trade him to a guy like an Asako or, or you know, a uh, guy in a cows we'll mention later. But I'm not liking his prospects long term. I think he's just going to be streakish. I would rather have a guy like Marzu or Edwards or Latrell when they're available after their injuries or buys. Big time. Totally agree with those ones. What I will say for Buller, though, is he has some nice matchups coming up. So Cronulla is not great. Obviously, they're not affected by Origin too much. But after that, I think he's got the Knights and then the Dragons. So for, for my team, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, all right, I got Rajab. He's a red dot in my team. I can sit Bula in that 19th man slot. And if he scores well, I'll just move Rajab into the starting side. So with Joey Manu, DPP, I move him into the centers and that allows that sort of transaction to take place. So I don't mind him being a bit up and down. He's shown he can score big. He's shown he can create those plays on his own. Um, but he's also going to have some of those games where he scores sub 20. So he's a high risk play. More of a loophole option, maybe a depth option. And at 577k, the price isn't so high that you, you really miss out on too much. Next guy I'll throw in here is Connolly Lemuelu. Now, disappointing score for him in 80 minutes, right? Yeah, agree. And uh, the thing with Connolly is he people have liked him all year because of how stable he's been. Um, when he plays 80 minutes, he's generally 35 plus. So I, I wouldn't be too worried about uh, Connolly's scoring output last week, but I am a bit concerned about the Dolphins' track record and Wayne making changes to his team week in, week out. Now, he's starting edge again this week, but Felice is out with a concussion, so I don't know what that looks like going forward. Um, they've now got Aitken coming off the bench who can play big minutes on the edge. Aitken is a guy I'm kind of looking out for. I know he got big minutes because of the Felice HIA last week, but he's shown that he's a very good scorer when he's playing on edge. But back to Connolly, um, I think you hold him for this week for sure. 80 minutes uh, probably guaranteed this week. But it'll be interesting to see his role for next week. I would potentially assess this week and next week. And then I think he has a buy in round 21. If he's not meeting your expectations or if he's showing signs of losing minutes or being benched again, then you can flick him in round 21 where most of their teams will have finished their buys by then. Yep, I agree with that. And look, he's at a, a price right now where you've really dropped off a bit. So if you had him from the start and you sort of had him from about 400K, 
you're not feeling too bad about this because you've made some money, you got some good scores, pretty good buy coverage. Um, the other thing to look at there is Jared Wallace comes back into that team too after three games off. So I think when we're looking at um, Lemuelu's minutes in the middle and Felice Kafusi coming back, that requires Kenny Bromwich to move into the middle forward rotation. So either I think Jared Wallace demands some minutes. I think they've been lacking in size. Potentially Ray Stone is the big loser out of that. So that, that'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, next guy here is Jake Turpin. Look, 544K. Uh, this is an easy sell in my head. He broke even as far as his price last week. What's he in your team for? He's in your team to make cash. So 544K, you got Brandon Smith coming back either around 20 or around 21 sort of thing there. Turpin is gone at that point. He requires big minutes to score points via tackles. Um, so for him, you know, 544K has done his job. Sell him off to one of the cash outs we're going to talk about and use that money to buy someone else, right? That's right. Uh, there's not much to add there. He is, his lifespan is ending. He's made us a lot of money and scored us very well off the bench. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be moving on this week. And then Sean Bloor, if you bought him in, would you be keeping him or? Yeah, I, uh, I don't actually know that his break even off the top of my head, but I assume it's pretty low because of his uh, hot yeah. run of form. Um, this was my issue because myself and my friend, we were discussing Bloor over the last couple of weeks that he's shown the scoring upside to be just as good as Papali when he's getting 80 minutes. Um, but with Bateman at lock, there were only a couple of losses away from a, a reshuffle. And, and they've shown that they've been willing to drop Bloor before. Um, he's had you know many times where he's been starting bench out of the side, back to bench, back to starting. So when you're running low on trades at this time of year, uh, it, it's not as worth getting these high-risk players in because the worst thing is they drop out of the side and you don't have the trades to take them out. So I would be holding Bloor this week based on a low break even and the fact that he plays. But if he's still benched next week and you have the trades to move him out, I think you need to move him out because the Tigers' second rolls when they're playing bench, they don't get big minutes. Now, I know Bloor kind of goes into this offloading mode where he scores at, you know, close to one PPM when he's playing off the bench. But even if he's scoring 30, 40, that's not good enough at this time of year. So um, I would probably hold for this week unless you've got an extra edge back row, um, and then sell it next week. Totally agree. Really simple choice. Hold on. Have a look. We'll talk about it next week. Last guy here, Matty Burton. And Burton's been on this list here and there through the year. Uh, he had a shocker last week. They got absolutely destroyed by the Knights, and he posted 17 fantasy points, which was not great. But typically, he's been a pretty solid base. So I'm willing to treat that as a bit of an outlier. Um, at the same time, though, I do view the Dogs as a team that will decline into the end of the season. And we've still got, what is it, two or three months left. So he's probably not a keeper for your final team. But as a guy who plays this week, I mean, I just look at my team, for example. I've got Nico Hines, Sean Johnson, Matt Burton. I was factoring in one of Hines or Burton would probably be picked for origin. If it was Burton, I might have moved him this week. Um, because of Sean Johnson potentially being out, Burton kind of covers that hard spot for me. So I'll be holding on. But at the same time, he's not a final keeper, most likely for your team. So you might as well make the move this week or next week before the money's all sort of dried up. I want to pose a quick question to you on that, Longy. How does Sexton signing affect Burden? Does this elevate the dogs and increases his performance, or does this just take base stats away from him? Because Sexton's a known dominant playmaker. He likes to kick the ball. Um, yeah, it's a good segue into the next section. Like he's, he's been, yeah, he, he's been rushed straight into the team um, as the halfback. You know, what do you, as a Burden owner, I'd like to hear your views on it. I think Sexton's a fantastic number seven. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. I, I think for real life, it benefits Burton enormously to have a genuine steering number seven who can control the game, who can kick, who can even take over goal kicking if needed as well. Um, I think it's a great move for the dogs. As far as Burton's fantasy prospects, it's, it's a mixed bag, right? So if we look at his base stats right now, he's got a fantastic kicking base because he does the majority of the kicking at the dogs. It's not that effective for them as a strategy. So I don't know if it's the best thing. 
And his run meters are really inconsistent as well. Unless he tears off a big run, he doesn't have that many run meters. So with Sexton coming in, he's going to lose a lot of those kick meters. I'd say it's going to be a 50-50 split between the two of them. But I'm hoping that if you look at this from best case scenario, it's probably a situation where he scores a bit more like Dylan Brown. So not fully in that Dylan Brown category of pure run meters and no kick meters. But I'd say we'd be expecting about five more run attempts per game from Burton. He's going to be receiving the ball at that second receiver, third receiver spot a lot more. He's going to have Avarillo at fullback as well, which is a bit different too, because uh, he's probably going to be a bit more of an effective support runner for Burton as well. So the, basically the question is more, because the, the stats could work either way, but the question is how well will the dogs go? So if Sexton comes in and he fixes the dogs a bit, then this is great for Burton. If Sexton comes in and the dogs keep performing poorly because their forward pack is it's really rough right now, then Burton won't have the attacking opportunities to make up for the lack of base stats, so it's going to be really bad for him. So for mine, I think it's a negative for Burton this year. I think it's a positive for Burton next year. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. I, I The only other thing I'd add is maybe Sexton takes the goal kicking away as well yeah. because I believe that Sexton's a pretty good goal kicker from um, when I remember seeing him at the Titans. Um, that's interesting. Is Sexton himself could be a bit of an option, I think, not this year at his price point, but next year, definitely. Um, he's played one game for about 72 this year. Uh, don't expect that going forward, especially in a shared playmaking role. Um, the other bit of big halves news this week is that Sean Johnson is potentially going to miss the game with the birth of his second child coming up. Um, he's been named this week, but it's unlikely. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say unlikely, but there is a good chance that he might uh, pull out this mm -hmm. week. So with people having to play two halves. Um, the good news is, well, the good news as a Queenslander is Nico Hines is not in the origin side yet again. So you'll get him as an option this week. But that second half spot might be difficult. So that's why you might want to keep a guy like Burden, just as Longy mentioned. Um, you know, we don't have Rajab this week. We both we both came into the Rajab play. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here this week. But we knew that. We spoke about this last week. And Longy mentioned it when we were discussing Bulla. You know, that red dot loop option is just as handy um but yeah there's not much more on sean johnson you just hold him uh if, if anyone was even considering selling him he's been one of the best players in fantasy this year uh yep. hold him for the rest of this uh rest of the season um same as the big red Corey. he's made the origin side uh he's been knocking on the door since the first game he's finally made it uh longy maybe a quick bit of chat from you whether you think he's a good fit for the origin team and then maybe what what his fantasy implications are yeah, I mean, it was him or Hopgood, right? That was that was sort of the toss-up for the Queensland. Um, they've chosen Horsburgh. I'd say Horsburgh's a, a great fit. Hopgood's just as good. They're, they're different kinds of players, but I think Horsburgh's going to come and do a great job for them. They've got some very mobile, aggressive middle forwards in that team, and he's going to fit right in. So he could be a guy that keeps that spot going into next year. I wouldn't worry about this too much as far as his fantasy prospects go. Um, he does miss round 20, though. So you do have two weeks without Horsburgh. And if you have guys like Jack DeBellin, guys like Joey Tarpane, you could potentially have quite a few mids out for round 20. So just keep an eye on that. Um, if you're carrying guys like Nelson or Sofa Solomon, you know, you'd be definitely be holding him. But even a guy like Fisher Harris or, or another middle forward that you're thinking of trading, just have a look at that round 20 fixture and just think, all right, maybe I will need that middle forward for that week. So that's all I'd say for him. Um, Johnny Bateman's the next guy, and we talked about him a bit with Bloor as well. Uh, look, he had a hit a rough game last week. He only played about 55 minutes, scored 33 points. Probably extrapolates to close to 50 points across the whole game. So it's not cause for disastrous concern. But he does move back to the edge. So uh, there is a lot of middle forward options this year. So him not getting the middle forward DPP in a few weeks is probably not the worst thing in the world. But it does reduce his value a bit, right? Yeah, I think his scoring takes a five to ten point hit. Uh, he looked like an absolute stud when he was playing 80 minutes at lock. He was racking up 50 to 55 tackles a week, 100 to 150 meters. He, he was looking like a bona fide 60, 65 point player. I think now he's back to a kind of 55 peak, um, especially in this Tigers team where attacking stats are quite rare. You would definitely hold him. He's still a keeper level scorer, but uh, I wouldn't be rushing to bring him in bringing him in as a top three uh, option in the mids or edge um, like I would have a week ago. Mm. He also might still play minutes in the middle. So yeah, Bloor true. is still there. 
they might bring him on. They, they're not obsessed with Fanua Pole. Uh, so, yeah, we could see still that score staying high. Um, last guy here is Jeremy Marshall King. And look, just on the news front, he was talked about as potentially season-ending shoulder injury, potentially three to four weeks. He's been named this week. It looks a little unlikely that he'll play in reality, but they might just be hiding what they're trying to do. Um, if you have Jeremy Marshall King, he's going to have to manage this issue for the rest of the year. And the Dolphins are quickly fading from finals contention. So that's a pretty easy sell in my eyes. Yeah, I think he's almost like that Jack, not quite there, but Jack Bird level uncertainty, mm -hmm. whereas they're just lingering issues. They're being named here and there. The coach is saying one thing. The press is saying one thing. Uh, you just don't want that in your life with like six, seven <laughs> rounds to go. So, you know, at 655K, you can almost take him up to, a, a, you know, a Harry Grant um, without much difficulty. Um, you probably wait and see to see if he plays this week. And if not, you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about um, a, a guy you can bring in for him at a discount. But, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate he's playing really well this year. But with an AC joint, when you're making 40, 50 tackles a game, it's not really too useful to be carrying a bung shoulder around. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, speaking of play well this year, um, we've been doing this all year in our fantasy content. So for everyone who's stick, stuck around for this long, make sure to like this video and drop a subscribe as well so you can keep up to date on all the good news and look as we go into next year as well, all that preseason news because there's going to be some very deep analysis going into 2024. Now, the buys. So we did change up the order a bit this week. The buys are... A bit more straightforward most of the time. There's a few tricky ones here, um, but the hold or sell was really interesting, so we wanted to start with that. Now, for buys, look, I'm going to pound through these a bit. Is um, Chime in if, if there's anything you want to add here. Nico Hines, arguably the best player in fantasy, lining up against the Tigers this week, must have. Jack DeBellin, again, one of the best mids in the game, super consistent, next to no injury concerns, played 80 minutes last two weeks. Yeah, you almost have to have him. Just look at round 20. Then Ryan Madison. I'll throw Ryan Madison to you. He's obviously edge and middle capable in, in fantasy. If you didn't have him right now, would you be looking to buy him? At 684K, he's tempting. Now, I have him. Um, I bought him a few weeks ago. Knowing that his scoring output might be a bit low over the next few weeks, just given that he's been filling in in the half spot. But he's the type of guy who does really well when the Eels are on a roll. Um, mm. And we've seen that he can average 60 and 50 minutes when he's coming off the bench. Now, again, he's in, you know, playing the halves this week. So, you know, you might expect another 40 point, 50 point score rather than a 55 to 60. But at 684K dual position, um, the only buy he has left is round 25 or 26 and the very last round versus Penrith. 27, yeah. even better. So, you know, by that time of year, you're either done or dusted or you're in with the shot. So you'll know whether you want him or not. But uh, I think he's a buy if you need someone in the middle edge spot because at 684K, I just think Parramatta are looking real good. They've got their troops back. I know they're missing a few this week, but um, Sean Lane is back. And we've seen that Ryan Madison, when he's running behind a forward pack or alongside a forward pack that is moving forward, He's busting tackles. He's making offloads. He can score a try. And what I really liked last week, um, sorry, the, the last game, and this might be different with lane back, but Madison played 40 minutes in the middle, and then he shifted to the edge for Davey and played 20 on the edge. So he got 60 minutes rather than his 50. Now, the difference with that is the 20 minutes he got on the edge, his PPM is going to be a lot lower than playing in the middle, but 60 minutes for Madison is a good sign. That may not happen with Sean Lane back, but um, at 684K dual position, the potential to average 60. If you have a gap this week, I would get Madison in. Yeah, I'm a big fan as well. 684K. Look, people were talking about him as a buy at 800K. So when you can get that value, you go get that value. Um, the challenge a little bit is the minutes of Parramatta, but like you're saying, I think 50 to 60 minutes is all he needs. Uh so it's not really at risk for Maddo. The other thing I'm going to point out here too is we've seen a lot of base games for Maddo where he's posted 60 points or 50 points or 45 or 65, you know, something like that. And it's been meters, tackles, and a sensible number of offloads. 
So we're seeing kind of the floor of Mado a lot of the time, and I think everyone's forgotten that he can post an 80 without doing anything too insane. Yeah. And he's probably going to do that over the next few weeks. So Yeah, and the games are getting tougher. Like the, the, the Dolphins game, he barely had to make a tackle. Like when he got on, there was not much to do. They scored like every set when he got on, so there was not much activity. And his last two, three scores in the mid-40s, that's as, as bad as it's got all year. Like before that, uh, he was 55 to 60 to, to 70. So um, don't have too much recency bias and be flummoxed by his recent scores. He's actually a stud uh, at 684K. Like I said, if you need a mid-range this week, get him in. Or otherwise, you can wait until he goes back to the bench uh, or the middle rotation next week. Love it. Rate it. Um, next guy here, another Parramatta player. So, again, round 27 by. Nothing else to worry about. Will Penasini, 599K. He's under 600K, which is uh, pretty juicy. Like I, I saw that price and sort of thought, oh, well, I always thought of him as a bit more expensive than that. Um, Penasini, fantastic form in real life. A bit crazy he wasn't considered for origin. I would say he's a better center than Bradman Best by by a bit of a margin, actually, at club level as well. But, um, hey, I'm not a selector for the Blues. If you if you needed a center right now, because obviously people are looking at trading out some of these centers, is Penasini a top-line guy you'd target? Uh, say you already had Joey Manu, for example. Yeah, that's a really good question because I'm in that situation. So I'll, I'll discuss it from my point of view. Um, I've got Joey Manu and uh, Simonson as my current starting centers. Now, the elite Simonson. I, I love Simonson, but I don't know how sustainable Bailey Simonson's scoring is. He's scoring a lot of tries. Eels are rolling a lot of teams. If Eels play like that till the end of the year, then. Bailey with a like last five average of 45 to 50 is definitely a keeper in the centers. I'm probably not bringing Penasini in. Do I think Penasini is a stud keeper in the centers? Yes. He was averaging in the high 40s um, before his recent run of form. And now he's just looking like he's taken another level. He's breaking the line a lot more. He's busting tackles. Uh, he, he made eight can look silly with one of the best individual solo tries a couple of weeks ago. Um, I would bring him in. I think he's going to be a top three or four center to end the year. I think Bird's out of the equation now. Like, you're not bringing him in. I think Joey Manu is going to be there. I think Isaac Tungo is going to be there and thereabouts in the form he's in. Um, so I think you need two or three of these players. But... The problem with me is I could bring in Penasini this week and move a Joey Manu or a Bailey Simonson to the fullback spot, but I don't think those two are keepers at the fullback spot when you've guys got like you know Mitchell, uh, Marzu, Dylan Edwards. So if you already have a Joey Manu and like another 45-plus center, I wouldn't bring him in. But if it's only Joey Manu and you've got, say, a Valencia filling in or another like you know a mid 30 center, then absolutely 599k get him in he he's a player who could just run hot for the rest of the season and go on that 55 average for like five six rounds yeah and he's the dominant force on that edge as well because the other side it's sevo sean lane and obviously simonson fitting in there running that crash ball every time but on the right side yeah sean russell's not not drawing too much cartwright's doing his job but penasini is the main event on that he, side, and he plays but, up and moves a lot there too. So you're saying that, but Cartwright is actually unlocking Penasini because a lot of these line breaks are Cartwright sucking in defenders and offloading. That's my point. That, That's my point. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought you were saying that the ball's going left. Yeah. Oh no, no, I'm saying everyone's there to support Penasini. So yeah, he's, yeah. he's oh, the right, yeah. of the right edge, right where it's all all built for him. Um, but he's just getting that work rate as well. So yeah, yeah that's he's right. Hot. He's he's a worker. He doesn't rely on tries like probably Bailey Simonson does. He makes tackles. He makes meters. He loves to offload. Um, even when you know the game script isn't as positive, Penasini can still crank out forty-five. Yeah, you could say he's uh, built like an Origin player. That, that's, that's what I'd say. <laughs> I mean, Brandy <laughs> came out and said that they looked at uh, best. They looked at Tungo, but they didn't talk about Penasini at all, which I'm I find oh. boggling that he is uh, the gun center in the 
one of the best attacking teams. He's been, you know, the the argument Brandy made is that best has been touted for Origin since he was eighteen. Penasini right. was one of the most hyped centers coming out of the juniors as well. Like, I know this is biased, so people might just, you know, we've got the Eels hat on, like literally and figuratively, I've got my Eels hat on. But uh, I don't understand how Best gets a look in. He's been inconsistent for one of the worst sides of the last five years. Yeah. Penasini has been one of the best in one of the best sides of the last few years. But anyway, that's not fantasy discussion. No, you're uh, right, though. He's, he's so underrated. He's so underrated. Um, but hey, well, we can make a whole video on that later. Um, if you're still here, drop a comment on what you think of Penasini. Should he be? Should he have been in the blue side, or who should have been instead? Last guy here is Reed Money, and this guy's here more for the fantasy coaches who are in a tough spot with money, right? So I've had a few people sort of hit me up and say, "Look, the edge of my bench is looking very weak right now. I need a guy for 500k. I need a guy for 600k. I need someone who I can rely on to score reasonably well most weeks." Reed Marnie could be that guy. Now, Reed Marnie is a guy that people talk about buying, you know, at different parts of the season at about 700K. And talk about him as value at that price. He obviously had a few injuries, a few games where he sort of went off early. He's come back. He's been around that 50 average the last few weeks. And at 525K, he's value. If we were before Origin or at the start of the Origin period, people would be talking about him as a must-have option as far as raising some cash and be a cut price guy through the buys. It's just that right now, everyone's looking at this top tier guns. So if you've got the money, you don't want to be buying Reed. But if you are strapped for cash and you may be going into your head to head finals or it just hasn't gone to plan this year, I don't mind Reed as a bit of a pod. Yeah. And you can cash out, well, not cash out, but you can make a bit of money going from someone like Turpin to Reed right now, which is always mm. a plus. Juicy, juicy. That would be a wild trade to move. Um, next up, cash cows. Cha-ching. So this is where you got to make a bit of that money. Um, probably not too much money making right now. Probably more cash outs at this yeah. stage. And, and Longy, um, before we get into this section, uh, how about it would be good if you talked about what exactly is the point of a cash cow at this point in the season? Because we discussed it you know, off air before we yeah. started, and it was a good discussion. So uh, what, what are your thoughts? That's a great call. Great call. So there's probably three things you could be looking for in a cut price purchase at this point of the year. First thing is you're looking for a guy who's going to make some quick money and you're buying them, but you know you're going to have to use a trade to trade them out later to make some cash, to make space for a guy like Cleary. So this is where we talk about, you know, buying a, buying a guy like Simkin, for example, a couple of weeks ago, just to make that quick money and to make that move. There's not too many of those guys, so I wouldn't count on that being your primary motivation for buying players. Second option here is buying a guy at a cut price level and using him as a depth piece. So Valence Tavare falls into that camp. And this is a guy where you probably won't rely on them week to week as a guy in your 17, but maybe they cover multiple positions. Maybe they've shown that they can score highly. Maybe they've shown that they have very high upside and could be a loophole option. And you're going to put them in that 18th man slot in your team or maybe even 19th man slot. Now, the third option here, and this is probably the more common option, and you need to have at least one or two of these guys in your team, is the loophole. So we talked about Rajab, right? And Rajab is wing fullback and half eligible, which is fantastic for a red dot in your team at minimum price. So these guys do need to be about 220K. You don't want to be spending big money for them. Um, but with a guy like Rajab, it means that we can keep a guy like Bula. So I can play Bula in not even the 18th man, but the 19th man slot. I can see how he scores at the start of the week. If he goes well, I'll shift for a job right into that starting side and I'll get Buller's score. Whereas if he doesn't go well, I'll just play things as they were. I'll leave him outside of the side. So the loophole is where the red dots really come into play. Um, it might even be worth us. No one's going to be loopholing this week. So maybe even for next week, making a loophole video. Um, I've done a bit of it with NRL.com as well, but we can go into that in more depth as well uh, next week. Is there anything I've missed there that you want to add on, or are you pretty happy with that? No, that's that's good. I mean, the only just on the first point I is I would only bring in cash cows for money making purposes, as you would, um, if they were worth two trades on. Uh, because like if I look at some of the players, their cash cows, they might make a hundred K, it's not worth two trades for, but players like Simkin 
as Longy mentioned, and Turpin a few weeks ago, who were making 200 to 250k, that's worth it. But if if there's players who are five six points underpriced, or um, you know someone like Sebastian Chris on on our list, they're not going to be worth trading out again when you bring them in. So just just remember that when you're when you're bringing in a low priced player, just remember why you're bringing them in. Mm. I guess they're that depth piece. Let's jump into these guys here too. So Valens Tavari first. Um, look, pretty straightforward. We talked about him a lot. He's scoring great. He's scoring great. He can find attacking stats. He's got a good work rate. This is probably the last week that you can buy him. So he plays this major buy round. He's still under 400K right now. Um, you're probably buying him as that depth option because he covers center. He covers wing fullback. He potentially, I mean, if the Dolphins heat up again, which they got Sean O'Sullivan back, they might. Um, he could potentially be a guy that you're loopholing into your team or even starting at a pinch. So I don't mind that option. If you've got the trades to do it, I- I'd move on balance right now. Yeah, I think he, I actually think he's potential to be a keeper in the centres almost because he has shown, I don't know, he's across 80 minutes, he looks like a 40 to 45-point player with um, high upside. Yeah, so there is. A, I think Valence is a is a must um, at three eighty nine k. I think he's won that spot. I doubt he's giving it back to Old Man Branko. Uh, he's the one cow this week that I think you probably need to get because I highly doubt everyone watching um, has five guys ready to go this week. And Valence is dual position, cheaply priced, potential keeper who plays this week. So. Uh, if there's one cow I'm recommending on this list, it's uh, Mr. Balmeninga. <laughs> tick, 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 tick. Love it. Next guy here, Sandon Smith, uh, 332K. It's getting a bit late in the piece here, but as a starter over three weeks, he scored, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, 41, 50, and 46, I think they are. Um, these are games where he's had one try assist in each game a couple of other scattered attacking stats, but mostly a pretty strong base where he almost looks like the mature half alongside Kiri um, in that he's taken most of the kicks. He seems to be a bit more balanced in his play. You know, Kiri threw that intercept pass last week. Um, He did have that little brain snap at the end of the Roosters game where he put a kick in instead of just passing the ball out where the Roosters could have won that game. So that's counting against him. But I think Sandon's look really good. Um, I wouldn't be buying him now at 332, but... If you're looking for that guy who could potentially be a depth piece and you are backing the talent, that's the big risk there with Sam Walker lurking. Seddon Smith, there's a world where he's a great, you know, 19th man, but there is also a risk in this and it is priced in. Yeah, and he's not playing this week either. So I think he's one to keep on your radar for next week. Uh, I think it's too risky bringing him in this week to find out he's being dropped next week. But yeah. at 330K, Longy, I don't think it's too late. If you can, if you think that Roosters will play him for the rest of the year at 330k and you're taking a 45 average player, um, you know, count me in. Like, if I feel that after his buy this week, Roosters are going to keep him at halfback, I'll bring him in. It's a big if, but to be fair, Luke Kiry had that broken jaw, they played through that. He's the exact kind of guy they shut down if their season's over. So, it probably is Sam Smith and Sam Walker. At that point, which again is great. So no, there's plenty of chances for him to stick it out. Um, Avril and Chris here, so I just have to fit these guys in. So it's 315k for Chris, 369k for Avarillo. Uh look, both interesting options, both guys who probably aren't primary fullbacks, but are playing there for the foreseeable future. Um, I'll let you speak to Avarillo first, because he's the first guy up. Yeah, Avril, look, he uh, is interesting. He had that run um, back when he played halfback uh, a while ago where he was averaging 50 and you could get him in the centres and he was the best centre in the comp. He's not. He's a bit up and down this year in the centre position because he's not a base at Sky, but he is a brimming with big playability. Mm. And the Dogs and their coach have come out and said they're trying to get Avril the ball early in sets where he can just you know, run around almost. And there's been a few games where he's scored a try or two where he's just run around everyone, kind of in the Dom Young style and just scored that long distance try. So Avrilo dual position, plays this week. Um, he, the thing with him is I'm not sure how great his scoring at fullback will be. He played quite a handful of games at fullback last year and he averaged 30. 
um, which is not really worth bringing him in for. But new regime, new play style, they could see him have a lot more opportunities to put on big plays. Um, so if you need a guy you know, to play this week in the wing fullback position who covers uh, both those spots for the rest of the year with quite a bit of job security, um, he's one you could bring in. Awkward price point because... You're not like you're leaving about 150k cash on the table versus bringing someone in at base price. Like, you know, for example, a Monroe um, next on the list who we'll discuss, but he's probably unlikely to get dropped as well. I know he signed with the Dolphins, uh, so the Dogs might try a few things with their future team at the end of the year. But I mean, the Dogs just look bad, so I doubt they can drop someone like Avrilo completely. So um, yeah. Chris is probably a safer option, but I'll, I'll let you talk about Chris. Oh, look, there isn't too much to add on Chris. Um, he's not the best fantasy scorer. He's 315K for a reason. He's played in that spot majority of the year. So he's priced pretty fairly. Um, I can't pinpoint a reason why he'd suddenly sort of elevate. So I personally think you either go Valance Tavare or you go a proper cash out um, yeah. at that spot. I'd skip both these guys. Um, next guy here is Tyrone Munro. And... The appeal here is that he's he's nearly a cash out and he's a rookie with a lot of talent. Um, I don't love his scoring profile from that first game. Uh, I don't think he sort of looks for the ball in terms of hit ups and, you know, those sideways crab runs where he drops the fend in here and there. I, I don't think he's got that scoring profile of a, a top tier winger for fantasy. Um, he could score some attacking stats. And if he somehow does keep his spot in the South team, it's a fantastic wing to be on. So. There is upside there. Um, he's a bit of a dice roll, but if you're buying him, you've got to be ready for a red dot. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's one I'm considering this week because at this point of the year, I'm just going all in. Like, having Avrilo and Chris is great, but um, I want that cash to get the top tier guns. And if my depth is tested and I have to play, you know, 16, so be it. I'm going all in, like a high risk strategy at the end of the year. I'm not high enough on the ladder. I'm still in the mid 500s kind of range. I'm not in the top 50 or 100. I need to try something different to make up the ground. So I'd rather just punt on a guy like Munro, take his score this week. And if he doesn't play again, so be it. I've pocketed 100k extra versus an Abril or a Chris, which could be instrumental in moving someone, you know, uh, to a Cleary uh, in, in the next couple of weeks when he comes back. So yeah, look, I'm not expecting anything from him. It's just another Rajab for me. If he gives mm -hmm. me some points this week, and he gives me some points here and there. Great. Otherwise, red dot and cash. I'm happy enough with that. Yeah, no, it pays. It's a cash out. And look, last one here, Ben Lovett. Um, I actually think this one's really interesting. And look, I haven't looked into Ben Lovett's stats enough to, to speak too confidently on this because I don't need him myself. But 225K, starting edge back rower over there for South Sydney. Pretty nice matchup. Uh, a lot of young playmakers coming into the team. So he's probably got some experience playing with the guys who are coming in. So those playmaking spots, which is not a bad thing. Uh, if you got him in and he scored, uh, let's say, 45 points this week and then never played again because Souths have a buy in round 20, not the worst thing in the world. The the edge back rower, red dot, is not a bad thing because if you've got Madison, for example, you might be loopholing an edge back row spot and then to lock that in, you could move Maddo into you know, the, the starting mid spot. So that guy in a 19th man slot can be loopholed in. Yeah, so, or Hopwood uh, as well. Everyone has Hopwood yeah. with that dual position. So Exactly, yeah. yeah. Or even Bateman if he gets it. Like, yeah. I, I like this one. Um, look, I'll jump into the last section here, and this one's pretty controversial. So we've got our, our various captain's options. Um, I'm considering five guys for captaincy this week. Um, firstly, Nico Hines, look, best player in fantasy. you got to look at that. Next guy, the Cronulla Sharks halfback. Um, thinking about him, nice matchup. Um, third guy, the the guy versing the Tigers. Obviously, that's a good thing. We saw Drinkwater last week. Fourth, the Blues rightful number six. And I'll give you a hint, it's not Jerome Luai. And fifth, uh, a surfer. So any surfer, but maybe the one in this image here. <laughs> I honestly think if you don't have Hines for this week, I... Like when are you ever going to bring him in? Like, I would move everything you have to get Hines in this week. Like, if you don't have yes. Hines this week, you, you've done it wrong. Like, you've got four trades, 
the number one priority is bringing in Heinz. If you don't have him already, I don't care who you have to sell. Get him in and captain him. And now that we've said all this, he's going to get a HIA in the third minute for sure. Yeah. We, we've cursed him, man. We've cursed him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, right, uh, maybe be contrarian. Maybe just captain Moylan this week. I don't know. Or, or Sean Johnson. We've talked about him being at risk. You could do yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, look, to, oh, here, I've got a way to fix it. To uncurse Nico Hines, make sure you comment below who you would captain if you didn't have Nico Hines. Make sure to give this video a like. Give us a sub. We'll see you on the next video. Good luck this week, beers. Good luck with your uh, EDM party. Uh, and happy 4th of July, doof, mate. Doof, doof, doof baby. <laughs> doof, doof.